Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. <clears throat> and I actually have some bad news or some sad news um, to start us off with. Uh, James Carse's stepdaughter emailed me this morning and he pa passed away last night. Um, James uh, was the author of Finite Infinite Games. He was a friend of the Stoa. Um, he was even going to be a sense maker in residence in uh, November. Um, but I'm told he did so uh, in his home that he loved with the woman that he loved. And he was a wonderful human being. Um, so may he rest in peace. And in his spirit, let us continue to play the infinite game here at the Stoa. Um, today we have a very special guest. We have Miriam Mason Martineau. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, uh, she's a therapeutic counselor and a parenting coach. Uh, she's the vice president of Next Step Integral. Uh, and she's a writer, author, um, and she wrote a chapter in this wonderful book, Cohering the Integral We Space. Uh, and as you know, the, the regulars here at the STOA, the STOA is becoming sort of this informal hub of all these conversational, uh, conversational and intersubjective modalities. We're inviting practitioners in, we're practicing them ourselves, uh, getting a, a kind of a sense and capacities to enter into these uh, deeply uh, uh, cohering spaces. Uh, and so today is going to be kind of cool because we're going to talk to uh, Miriam about uh, not so much her experience with the spaces, but sort of the inner work required in order to get into them. Um, so that being said, how it's going to work today, it's going to be uh, me and Miriam are going to have a chat for about uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes. Uh, anytime, start throwing your questions in the chat, put Q in front of it. Uh, I'll call on you and mute yourself, ask it, ask your question to Miriam. And then um, if you don't want to be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, just indicate that and I'll read it on your behalf. Um, and there's something I want to experiment today. It's the first time. Uh, I was just taking Richard Bartlett's course and then they have all these like uh, as in spiral course and they have all these kind of like hand gestures you do, like these resonant fingers and stuff like that. I don't want to do that, but there's something he, he did like to wrap up a question. If someone is going on on a question, just the facilitator does this. Uh, in a very gentle way. And this is not to say that the question is bad or anything, it's just to kind of indicate gently that uh, to make room for someone else to make a question, make a statement and to land it. Uh, so I will do this. Hopefully I won't have to, but I will do this if, if someone is um, going on with their question and then I will eventually uh, jump in. Um, so that being said, Miriam, welcome to the SOA. You're, you're allowed to unmute yourself now. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you all. So, yeah, maybe um, we can get some background, uh, like some kind of context of uh, how you came into uh, the work that you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. It goes way back. Um, I was just telling my daughter, actually, she's 17 now, but my husband and I met in 1990, and that was before email or before we were using email. And uh, so we were writing letters for two years. I was in Switzerland. He was in Canada. And a lot of our letter writing was actually about community and how we need to come together as a human family. And this is what's stopping the evolution of humanity. So it kind of started, I think, really through our coming together um, as a couple and becoming fellow researchers and inquirers into this topic um, and living in community then for 10 years and doing a lot of experimentation of what does it take to come together in community or in communitas where you don't lose yourself um, because we've seen that happen and it's not good um, but also where you don't just reside in the separate self for all eternity and never actually um, evolve what's possible as a collective so that was really the driving inquiry um, for that decade and then beyond we tried it in many different formats um, retreats seminars living together with people um, and just our own ongoing study and inquiry in the topic. And then my therapeutic work is much more one-on-one -on -one and working with couples, but it actually informs the questions hugely because it's all about what does it take for us humans to show up in a way beyond all the, the, the labels we put on ourselves. What does it take for us to show up for who we truly are? And, um, that is beyond our biography. 
and allow our actual authentic essence to express itself more fully than ever and yet be present to one another without all these barriers of separateness um, so that we can actually give rise to something that's much more in our midst. I think that's really been our, our focus is how can we how can we give voice to that which arises when we come together that is actually more than the sum total of us? And in our decade of community living, we happened, I, I think a lot of it was grace, but we happened to um, stumble upon some really profound collective experiences of that nature right at the start. And then we got very curious in unpacking what are the, what, what's the recipe, what are the ingredients so that this is not just a state. Because I think even, even to this day, we can experience these deep states of togetherness and, um, and collective intelligence, collective wisdom. We can experience these as momentary glimpses and tastes. And we, we, we have a pretty good read, I feel now, on what is conducive. You know? And in my experience, making music together is a really good in. Um, celebration, dance, coming together. I was just at a, a friend's wake on Sunday. And when you come together with others around things that matter and that remind you of the actual context of life, that often really brings a much uh, deeper shared field in our midst. Um, and also when daily life's challenges are not as present. That's why retreats and seminars and, and you know, I've never been to Burning Man. I hear it, it works there too. Um, so those kind of events can really allow us to get a, a taste of what's possible in our collective evolution. But then in daily life, we seem to trip up a lot. And, and I feel like we've made so much headway in our individual journeys. Um, but there's still, a, there's still a real ceiling there as far as our uh, latent potential, um, being able to, to come to fruition in the collective. And, my husband and I are really of the mind that it is the key to making, um, making it through into a future that is sane and sustainable for all. Yeah, I like that. A couple of things were coming to mind is the, you know, the, what Ken Wilber talks about uh, from making a state to a trait uh, and how practice is needed for that essentially. And then the other thing that came was uh, Soryu Forel's, uh, who's uh, head at the Monastic Academy, when he was talking about circling, uh, <laughs> he kind of threw shade at it. And he basically said that the circling is um, intimacy without friendship. It's like kind of get the, the verisimilitude of intimacy, but you don't have any commitment beyond that. And in order to make this kind of state into a trait, you need some kind of structural commitments or call to your practices and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, any, any thoughts on anything I, I just said right there? Well, I, I totally agree that, um, you know, I, I would never negate those moments of intimacy because I feel like they're doorways, they're windows into what's possible. And, and I think they fulfill our deepest yearnings in a moment. And so it's, it's like you kind of get lifted up to the top of the mountain and you get to see the view. Um, but then you come back down and you actually have to walk up that path up the mountain and and you'll have moments when you're doubting yourself and where you know it gets stormy etc cetera, etc cetera. so back to the the question of how can communitas how can that collective being together and giving rise to something in our midst that is more than the sum total of us and that has a voice and that has intention and a will and that we could potentially receive guidance from for moving forwards um, as a humanity like what does it take in us to be present to that in daily life and i think that's a bit maybe the topic we could explore today of you know it it it, it, it is practice it's like working muscles in us and what are those muscles so i'd be happy to go in that direction if that feels interesting to to all of you yeah. Um, before we go on that thread, um, can I just double click on the word uh, communitas or communitas. Um, uh, we, ha we have a, like this, uh, we're launching a communitas club here at the store where we're exploring all these intersubjective practices and stuff. And we're out, uh, um, Mary, um, Margaret, who's in the uh, audience today, me and her are going to run it and we're debating, what should, what should we call it that? Because it's kind of like a mongrel concept, at least how I use it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it means many different things. Um, and I guess the distinction I have is sort of like, it's like I, it type of way of relating versus an I, thou relating, also relating for its own sake. It's like practices or a state that a lot affords that. 
Um, I'm just curious, how, how do you hold that term? I know I'm the one that suggested it for the title as well, but uh, how does that land for you? Well, I, I like it. So you, you sent it to me by email. I've heard my good friend Jamie Will uses it a lot. Um, I like it because I find the word community is, is, has been used and used and overused and it has a lot of associations for people that kind of either just throw them off or actually guide them down the wrong imagination of what, what, how we could evolve that. So I, 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 I stay away from community. I often talk more about village or we practices or togetherness. Um, and I love Comunitas. I actually went and looked up a definition that I could find after you sent me the email. And it resonated beautifully. It was um, coming together in intimacy, right in liminality. So right at that threshold of the unknown. And I thought that was very telling for what we're exploring because I think one of the skill sets is actually to become quite familiar and maybe even comfortable with being at the edge of the unknown together. Um, so I, I think it's a great word, I like it. I love how you uh, phrase that. Um, okay, so uh, the inner work needed to get into this uh, delicious state. Uh, what do you think? Okay. Well, I'll start by saying I think it's an ongoing journey. It's never done. Um, that um, in, in, in the way I frame it, it really includes both our vertical maturation and growth and development as well as horizontal capacities and I can get more into what I mean by that um, but with the vertical it's really about growing in our consciousness growing in in the journey of awakening getting to know remembering who we truly are um, so practices of stillness of meditation of really daring to remember that under all the shoulds and shouldn'ts and thoughts and beliefs, um, yeah, all those the, those sticky notes that we put on ourselves and that other, others put on ourselves, there is a, a core you that was there from the moment you arrived and that doesn't actually need to be developed or constructed, that is just there, is already whole. So to remember that wholeness, um, or that coming home to yourself. I feel like that's a, a huge one. And then, and then getting skilled at knowing when you're entering any conversation, any relationship, any, um, yeah, any relationship, which self are you coming from? Are you actually coming from that home within or are you coming from the constructed more outside self um, that you have built in an effort to manage and function and make do in this world where once we realize when we're about one and a half, two, that we're actually separate in many ways from our mom and dad and siblings and those around us, it can get pretty scary. And so we start patching together a constructed self. Um, but um, yeah, so that's one piece is, is the, the vertical, which I think is it's, it's an evolutionary arc we're all on and we're at different places in that. And each place has its purpose and it's not at all to make the ego self or the constructed self bad. I actually think that's a real mistake. I think it's much more to be in right relationship to it. So to, to think of it more as that we're, a lot of us anyways, are still um, under the spell of a mistaken identity and it's much more to write the relationship to that outside constructed self rather than to feel like it shouldn't exist or it's a bad thing or it's the thing that's keeping me from my spiritual growth. Um, I actually think if, if, it, if we didn't have it, it wouldn't even be here in these, in these physical bodies. Um, so, so yeah, that, that is a big part of it though, is remembering who you are and being willing, having the courage to, when we come together with others, to actually bring that forth and that can feel unknown too. And sometimes the path to it can feel quite overgrown. So there's a practice there of like what works for each of us might be different to rediscover that. And you know, I often say to people, what is it that, what is it that helps you feel truly most alive? You know, and it'll be different things for different people. Some it'll be like having the most intense conversation where they're so in it that in a way they forget themselves and but they feel more themselves than ever before. And for another person, it might be when they just have those moments of dancing 
without any self-concern or lying on on the ground and just breathing deeply or I, the, the ways there are as many as there are humans on the planet. So I think it's much more to find out what works for you. When do you feel most alive, most you without trying to be you? Um, when do you feel most at home? And can you start discerning within yourself between when you're in a way there and when you're not? Um, and I think there's many, many spiritual practices and paths that have been uh, discovered and shared and taught about. So I, I won't go into much more detail on that for now. I'd like to also look at the horizontal capacities because in my experience, and, and those are kind of like a big embrace, like a big embrace to self and humanity, right? One is sort of growing up, the other is growing out. And can we make that circle of care and concern and love wider and, um, and fuller? both to ourselves and to others. And a question that's been very alive for me in this quest, and I'd say even more as I've gotten older is, is uh, can we not just be intelligent and articulate and conscious and spiritual? Can we actually just be basically decent human beings? And that's kind of what I mean with the horizontal. It's like, what, what does it mean to show up as a decent human being? And then I'll often add, how can we be decent under duress? Because it's one thing to show up decent when the sun's shining and um, all is well, but how can we really draw upon qualities and values and ethics that make a life well lived when the going gets hard? And, um, you know, so those would be practices of generosity, practices of integrity, of, um, of respect, of treating one another no matter age gender culture race what have you no matter anything just treating one another with respect and with dignity and with integrity and i you know because my work is so often with parents it that that comes up a lot with little ones like how can we treat the little ones with all the respect in the world with all the integrity and dignity no matter their age but you could say the same about our elders and about really any human being i think if we could just get that one right we could solve so, so many um, of the challenges we're facing now that just seem to be getting more extreme. So on a, on a daily life, do you want to say something, Peter? Or should I just keep going? I'm, I'm enjoying this. Okay. Um, in, in daily life, to me, it's like it's working both those muscle sets. It's like, how can I keep... Um, how can in, in a way let's let's just talk about that that or remembering who you are how can i remember who i am but also work with the ego self like that which which um that which we build when we realize how fragile how tender the human being actually is like we have such thin skin i'm always amazed like that we we survived some of us survived like my grandma became 100 and died last year like she made it until then like it's an absolute miracle when you think how fragile we really are. Like it just takes a stick to poke at you and you've already got a dent in you. Um, but then also psychologically and, and emotionally, we are fragile beings. Um, and yet we also can claim and grow such sturdiness and resilience. So a uh, question that I really think about in, in, the, in the sense of those horizontal skills is how can you grow a an ego coat, so it's lightweight. So it's like a lightweight coat rather than clunky armor, knowing that, yes, we have these tender selves, that when the going gets rough or when it's stormy outside, we need some protection. So we build that outside self. But can it be a coat that, you know, has pockets, that has things in it, but doesn't get completely bogged down with massive amounts of fear um, and trauma and defense mechanisms and reactions. So a lot of the work is to see where that coat has gotten clunky and has become like armor and to do the shadow work, do the trauma work, do the um, self-awareness work of who am I? What are my tendencies? What's my type? Where do I tend to trip up? Um, how can I work in a complementary fashion with others rather than in a rivalrous one? And, and bringing those horizontal and vertical skill sets together really is I often talk about it as, as um, if you think of us like all like instruments, you know, one of you might be a violin, one a cello, one a flute, one a guitar, et cetera. Um, 
if, if you think about the, the work of coming together to give rise to what's in our midst, then it's a bit like if you wanted to play music with others, whether that's a duet or a trio or in a band or an orchestra. If you were a musician, which I'm sure some of you are, you would never stop playing music together without first tuning your instrument. You just wouldn't. And once you start playing, if you would notice by listening, by self-awareness, right, by being attuned, by listening, that you're out of tune, you wouldn't continue. You would actually, you know, you see, you see, especially the, the violin players, like they'll quickly do quick tuning. Um, you, so you would stop and then you would retune and then you'd play again. And I, I use this metaphor a lot when working with couples because, I mean, couples will just jam themselves into, um, uh, talking about something and get completely out of tune or start out of tune and uh, be expecting to play music. So there's something there about once we are working on our horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical capacities and really integrating them. So, you know, I do come from a, a, a very integral perspective on life. It's, it's always resonated deeply with, with the way I experience life is, is to grow in depth and width um, so to, to hold both the psychological and the spiritual and the physical and, and the social and all these aspects, um, that they all are part of us becoming well-tuned instruments and knowing that we float in and out of being in tune and out of tune and that's completely fine. So another horizontal capacity is to meet and greet ourselves and others with kindness and compassion um, and forgiveness. You know, it's something I, I often say to my clients is, can we just go at this as if we're pre-forgiven? You know, because, because ultimately I think we are. So can, can we actually go at this with a vulnerability and a courage and a resilience understanding that because we're humans, it's already for sure that we're going to make mistakes and trip up and fall flat on our faces. So if we can just assume we're pre-forgiven, it can actually allow us to take risks and to, um, to, in a way, do the challenging work of waking up and, and, and growing up, but within a, I guess it's almost like within an already embrace, like within a vessel of you're already loved, you're already seen, you're already heard. Um, because the, I have just seen too many times uh, the efforts at community, village making, um, you know, or, or, or the retreats and the seminars where you're attempting to do that. I've, I've, I've seen so many excellent aspirations and good intentions and deep thoughtfulness and great theory around this topic. And before people can even blink, something can come from who knows where, some shadow, some trauma, um, some deep hurt that just pops up and can literally just destroy the whole effort. So to, to, to not fool ourselves, like we really have to pay attention to our psychological wellness as much as our spiritual um, integrity. And, uh, and so I guess I, I wanna emphasize that in this conversation. So I'll ask one more question. Uh, start putting your questions in the chat and I, I will call on you in a moment. <clears throat> so what was coming to mind, um, so this place is called the Stoa and no one's a Stoic here except me, basically. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a practicing Stoic. And one thing I find with doing the Stoic algorithm, um, it engenders what I call a para-egoic state rather than like a trans-egoic state, like some of the Buddhist traditions are, are non-egoic, where you feel your ego, it's right here, but it's like on the side and you can still operate and be effective in the world um, without it kind of like overcoming you and co-opting your, your behavior. But if you just stay there, you, you, you know, you can become a sociopath. And I think a lot of people who have trauma just become stoic in, in that sense um, without any of that inner work. Uh, but I also like, I'm also an Orthodox Christian, the Eastern tradition, uh, and they have a beautiful practice uh, called the Jesus prayer. And essentially, like you say, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you focus on the words coming out. And then you, you kind of, while still focusing on the words, you focus on your mind and then you focus on your heart, then you drop your mind to your heart, then you focus on all three at the same time. And it really has a somatic effect. 
and then you're just basically unifying them uh, what they what they call theosis. Um, so that's what I get from the horizontal practice that you're referring to. So I'm wondering, um, is there any kind of like go-to practices you, you recommend in order to have kind of like a healthy relationship with the ego and also have that horizontal thing of like loving kindness or whatever? Or do you think it's like has to be a bespoke journey towards each one of those things for, for each people or each person? I think having now worked for over two decades as a therapist and and just you know being married for longer than that and and just being a human for even longer than that um i i think what's key is that we know the work is ongoing that we understand that shadow is real and we need to find a way to uncover it and integrate and transmute it that trauma is real, that in my view, there is no such thing as a non-traumatized human. There's bigger, larger, deeper, fuller ones. Um, and there are little jolts to sensitive nervous systems, um, you know, so, and then there's everything in between. Um, we all come with tendencies. Uh, we, we all have a typology. So getting to know that is a really excellent practice. Like just get to know yourself, know what are your likely stumbling blocks? What are your likely brilliances? That kind of thing. Um, finding a way to connect with the biggest context possible is, is another key piece. And for some that could be devotional prayer. For another, it could be meditation. For another, it could be a contemplation on death. Um, for another, it could be being present at birth uh, or just simply vulnerability can really open up a door or beauty. For me, beauty is huge as far as context setting. Um, so, but, so, so the way, the way to, for others, it's reading philosophical texts, but the, the, the way to that larger context of like, it's, in a way, it's, it's the, the remembering of what actually matters. And it's not that it all needs to be big and huge and fancy because what matters can happen in the stillness between you and another or you and a dandelion. So um, the, the practice within oneself of, it's like building a sturdiness or resilience. So I'm all for high, I, I am a, a I have a lot of sensitivity uh, so I know that feeling like my skin feels thin in this world and I, I find it quite intense to be a human being on this planet and the outside affects me greatly and I think my inside you know comes out quite easily um so a, a, a practice around this whole how do you become a decent human being that has really worked for me is to build sturdiness, to build resilience. So rather than to then shut down because we feel so much or because feeling so much is actually part and parcel of being fully human, rather than to create gates and walls around that, can we actually grow a sturdiness from within? Um, and that then really touches on skills like getting to know your nervous system, know how you can regulate, what suits you, what are your main top three to five triggers the ones that just you know my de definition of a trigger is that which when it hits you makes all your personal growth and all your spiritual aspirations flow out the window at a second's notice that would be a trigger so if you can identify those and usually triggers underneath them have unmet needs and so once you know what the trigger are you can follow the the tap root down find out what's the need under it that's not being met which then really is a beautiful diagnostic tool to find out now, how can I soothe that? When that trigger comes, what do I actually need to do to address it, to allow myself to regulate? So um, in a way it's getting together, I guess, like a toolkit that is both, um, it, it's, it, it's psycho-spiritual. And then I would obviously include the body in it too. So we, we don't need to go in that. I think that's the topic that has become widespread now, which is awesome, but you know, what do we feed our bodies? What do we feed our minds? What do we feed our hearts and souls? All of that counts. Um, I do think there's some very specific practices that are 
that are key when we want to lean into the unknown together as much as possible from our authentic selves. And one is that intrapersonal, so it's the discernment within myself of when am I residing more in that constructed outside social ego self? And when am I resting home in literally in my soul, in my essence, and to start knowing that difference and even feeling it somatically. Like we, I always find it's funny how we theorize about these things, but it, it really lives in the body. Like how does my body feel when I'm um, residing home? And, and I've noticed a lot with my clients is just vocally. So I, I'm a singer on the side. And, and so I pay a lot of attention to voice and I've noticed sometimes when my clients come in, when they're not centered, when they're not grounded, when it's like they're out of tune, when they're off, their voices are a lot higher. Uh, there's like a frenetic kind of energy. And during the session, you'll often, the, the voice will, will come down. It'll start resting deep down in the chest. Um, it, it's like even the voice comes home. How does it feel in your chest when you're home versus not? So picking up and getting really curious about any of those clues that help you discern which self am I bringing forward in any moment. And like you said, Peter, it's not about getting rid of the ego. It's about having right relationship with it so that when it matters, you can lay it. It's like, you can just gently put it to the side and say, okay, you sit here like a little cat and I'm going to work here on bringing forward my authentic me into the circle because in all our study of this topic, Stefan, my husband and I, the, 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 the key to coming together without losing self and actually becoming more yourself than ever before. So where distinction is, is maintained, but separation is dissolved. The key to that is our authentic self. Like when we're really home in who we are, like that identity beyond biography, that is the key to showing up in an unrivalrous, all considerate, sovereign fashion. That is it, in my experience. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so we're going to pivot to questions. Uh, cool, there's some, so much good ones. Uh, let's go with Steve. You had a question. Stefan? Uh, Steve Henry about the uh, urgency of communitas. Okay. Um, I feel a sense of urgency that this is needed right away. And yet it seems like what is that this takes time, this kind of development. And so I'm wondering how you cope with the sense of urgency versus the time that's needed. First, um, your heart, uh, your question just touches my heart. Like I almost have tears when I hear it because I live with this question every single day and I couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, the funny thing is I've been feeling the urgency since my twenties and I'm now in my early, I'm 51. And so it's, it's been, it feels like a long haul of feeling the urgency. And I think I'm going to borrow some of my, my husband Stefan's theories around this because you know, having lived with him, um, it would be beautiful actually if he was here. I, I think he, he has felt this urgency since the day he was born. So I just want to say I, I so get that feeling. And I think the way the world's going right now, it's, it, it is becoming more and more, I'd say important. I'm, I'm gonna, maybe going to move away from the word urgent, but pressing and important that we can break through. Like I, I literally feel like the future of humanity is dependent on it. So, and at the same time, like you said, yeah, it, this is a long journey. However, so partly I'm talking about skills we can acquire, partly I'm talking about a journey of maturity. So there are, I think, more and more people who have the capacity for what we're talking about. I still think we have, sometimes one side in this, like there's people with a lot of horizontal capacities, and, but who haven't maybe developed so much of their vertical um, and, and the other way around. At this point, I'd almost sometimes prefer working with the horizontal elegant people, um, like to have 
truly decent people because I feel like the, the possibility of coming home to self is, is already always there. Like we tend to make that path very far in the future. You know, it's like, oh, it's at least over on the other continent. But in my experience, it's at least as a state, it's the tiniest little shift within myself. Like it's accessible at all times. And I can't tell you how many times in, in, my, uh, in my therapy sessions, I'll, I'll, do, I'll ask a question. I'll literally say, can you locate in yourself as a state that home within where no matter what's going on, no, ma no matter what, you're completely and utterly okay, completely and utterly loved, completely seen and free and heard and alive and vibrant. Can you find that state within yourself? And usually within a matter of seconds, every client I've worked with can find it. It's not far away. So when the container is safe, when uh, the relationship, the foundation of a relationship feels like something you can, you can be vulnerable in and on. To, to come home, at least as a state, is not hard. To stay there is where it takes that knowing that inner discernment, the commitment, the will in a way, the, uh, the, the remembering how important it is to do that. I think there are more and more people who have the horizontal capacities, I think the, the, that, that coming home you can access. Um, and I actually, you know, I could be wrong on this. My husband and I could both be wrong on this. We talk about this a lot. I'd say over 90% of humanity, if we could break through to some kind of sane existence, even if it's just a small collective doing it at first and start creating systems and structures from there, over 90% of humanity would easily happily glide into that without having to do kind of the, you know, creating the groove. Like most people are just wanting to live a good life and are tired of the rat race and this rivalrous thing. It doesn't mean we can't all get rid of the rivalrous nature that we are, but there, I think there's more and more people who feel like that, that arc has kind of done its time. We're literally destroying ourselves at this point. Um, so I, in that sense, I have hope. However, and here I'm gonna uh, borrow the, uh, one of the theories of my husband, because he, he's, he's been hammering this for, in, into my, my consciousness forever. And, and it's that those of us who have the incredible privilege and the, the, the education and the time on our hands and the literally all the gifts and blessings to be able to sit in this call right now. Rather than feeling like everyone else just needs to catch up to us, what if we included that as a, as a, as a consideration, but if we put our focus onto onto moving forwards, like moving beyond what we already know, moving beyond what we're already comfortable with, moving beyond, like literally sitting right at the edge of the unknown, becoming familiar with sitting in uncertainty together where all we bring totally humbly is literally like this little offering bowl of here's my authentic self and I'm coming together with you and you and you. And now let's see what's possible. And can we get comfortable to sit in stillness until there's a, a nudge, an impulse to speak through that little bowl. Um, you know, so I, I think I took a few little loops there, but the, the, the idea is, yes, it's urgent. Thinking that we need to somehow get the masses to this place, I don't think is realistic or possible. I think if we actually um, focused our focus on moving that next, it, it's kind of like a next step, but it often feels like a leap because it's asking those of us who are feeling that edge to literally relinquish that which we hold so dear and that we've practiced and polished so much all our entire lives, which is highly sophisticated ego selves that can talk spiritual and look spiritual and convince pretty much anyone else that you're intelligent and a marvelous human being, and you, you probably are but can we actually let go of, of even the thinnest veil that we're still holding and literally come humbly into the circle with others? Um, 
I don't know if that gives any answers. I'm sitting in the inquiry with you. So if you have any thoughts, I'm very receptive. Do you have any uh, follow-up thoughts or questions, Steve? No. No, I appreciate your answer. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Susan, you had a question. Um, Marianne, thanks for being here. Uh, great conversation. Um, so, and it kind of, just kind of, I'm going to wrap it up in what you just talked about in terms of holding a safe space uh, for those who are willing. Um, and, and you know, yet we run into and we deal with people who, um, they're not aware of their own triggers. And of course, you know, specific to uh, when you talk about trauma, um, they of course have a visceral reaction. Um, how do you deal with that? And especially in light of, you know, is this, is this a win-win or no deal situation? So, the setting makes a big difference. So in a, in a therapeutic setting, that's one thing. When you're trying to um, build communitas or, yeah, mm. or a village together, that's another thing. And there's things you can borrow. Um, you know, one of my central contemplations in the last few years has been what kind of culture do we need to build so that we can be very elegant with working with and through trauma when it comes so it doesn't trip up the incredibly important effort of coming together mm -hmm. um, and how can you do that and you know I borrow insights here from my work as a therapist which is the rather than when trauma comes that everyone freezes around I was like oh my god you know let's run yeah. the hills and the whole thing falls apart which has happened many many times mm -hmm. um, rather than doing that and having sort of a, a a mirrored freeze reaction from everyone around. In my experience, the, the more, I'll put it first with the individual, the more an individual can, can live into being pre-forgiven and can mm. step into trauma work in an even larger vessel of love. So it's like the bigger the love, the more possible to deal mm. with trauma. Um, and we often think of love as something on the other side or being connected with self or, or becoming unfrozen on the other side of trauma. So a, a big part of what I'm um, thinking as far as a, a culture that can do this elegantly is can we marry what is often um, apart? So can we you know, literally bring these incredibly uh, generous, important capacities of being pre-forgiven, already loved, safety, um, compassion, the, the, the notion that it's, we often talk about your ego, my ego, your trauma, my trauma. What if we just put it in the middle and it wasn't so personalized uh, because that would also help with bringing down some of the defense mechanisms. Then it's just like, oh, trauma has entered the space. How are we going to work with it rather than Susan's trauma just tripped us up or Miriam's trauma just did like mm -hmm. how can we actually just work with or ego patterns oh an ego pattern just floated through what are we going to do with it you know we're just going to ignore it sometimes ignoring is great are we going to just see it um, are we going to work with it uh, so one is to in a way depersonalize like bring it into the middle the other is to assure ourselves and one another as a culture that no matter what you are loved, no matter what I am loved. Um, because the times I have seen people pull away when trauma happens is when there's a lack of, there's a freak out basically, there's a lack of um, connection and, and feeling accepted and, and, and seen and heard and sheltered and embraced through it all. And so there's a lot of shame then that comes in and embarrassment and then everyone, um, goes apart rather than stays turned towards each other. To me, it's like, can we create a culture where we don't get bogged down by this because it can also become an endless, endless journey of just uh, psychological work. Can we keep the, the direction of where we need to head as a human family sort of right at the fore of our minds and, and focus? 
But when something comes, can we have the skill to work with it, um, I guess elegantly really, like efficiently, lovingly, uh, where there's, a, there's an awareness for these things, for one thing, so they can be named. And there's a clear understanding of what we do when it happens ahead of time. Um, and that we do it in a way that doesn't add in the secondary burdens of shame and embarrassment. Uh, I think that's really a huge piece. So those, those are some of my thoughts. I, you know, I'm, I'm working on this a lot in my writing is like, how can we create a culture of ethics and, um, and agreements that is conducive to this kind of work happening where we don't get tripped up? Because like I said, I've just seen too many great efforts sadly really just fall apart and i think the time now more than ever is that we are smart about how we go about this and so we know where the pitfalls are and we're prepared to work with them um yeah so i always say make the vessel like it sounds maybe simplistic but when you really put it into practice it, it's 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 quite incredible can you can you always make love bigger than everything else like if you're having a conflict with your partner okay the conflict's there you get the information from it, you try and tune it. Can you just, just for a moment, expand the context, make the love even bigger and ask yourself, what would love do in this moment? And it might do something astonishing, like now's not a good time to talk. Let's revisit this. Or I really need to take a week just to consider something. Or, you know, it doesn't always mean diving in and being soft and warm. It can actually mean also what would love do can mean that I grow my ability within myself to be uncomfortable. Like, can I, can, I, can I develop a capacity to handle stress and regulate at the same time and this, in this way stay in the conversation? Can I grow resilience to stay in rather than have to pull out as soon as the going gets hard? Um, and this is where I think emotional intelligence and wisdom are as important as spiritual awakening. Um, I'd actually put them all in the same pot, but you know, if you're going to tease them apart, they're as important. Uh, and it's, it's one of my favorite quotes. I have no idea who said it, but it lives on my fridge. And it's like, instead of waiting for the storm to pass, can we learn to dance in the rain? This is in a way what I'm talking about. Like, can we stay in the fire? Can we stay in the rain being kind and compassionate and forgiving and loving enough so that we can keep doing the work in the rain rather than going, okay, that's too much. Got to take a break. Wait until the storm has passed. All right. Um, maybe Gray, you had a question. Um, yeah, sorry. I hope that my, my mic is working. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, cool. Um, so my question was about, um, I hear you talk about like this, um, like trying to locate this like deep down place where everything's okay and you feel at home. Um, and I was just wondering, like, I know that you say that for like 90% of the people it's easy. Um, but I find that a lot of times it's not super easy for me. Um, and so I wonder about uh, what, what your advice would be for people like me or other people who have maybe more difficult backgrounds and didn't get like to develop that deep down home feeling uh, before uh, how we can maybe discover it for the first time or or dig under whatever is burying it to get at that yeah beautiful um i'd like to start by just saying and i, I think it kind of swam in your words it's never too late um i'm absolutely convinced of that um we can always we can always find that wholeness because it, it is there it might be very tucked under but it is there so um, healing is always possible. And sometimes we have stories of attachment that was insecure or that was fraught with anxiety and difficulty that can make it much harder because we do live in these bodies, right? And in this emotional body and physical body and mental and spiritual. So there's, uh, it, it, I, I hear you. And I think um, this is where I sometimes have this image of it's there for all of us that your core self is is fully alive and there but the path to it can sometimes feel overgrown like 
you know, almost like you got to get a machete out the first time and kind of cut your way through. And then over time, the more you come back there, the path kind of gets made and then it does become easier. So in those kind of situations, I feel like working one on one with someone who is skilled in both the psychological and the spiritual realm um, and who is trauma informed and has a background in attachment and childhood development. Um, that that's what I would suggest, um, you know, that, that, that I think is, is the way because it, it's, a, it's a journey. And for some of us, there's a quick, easy access. But you know, when I say clients find it within seconds, usually these are clients I've been working with for quite a while on these topics we've been talking about. So I have to give some context to that also. Yeah. But to remember, even sometimes I think change happens if we just start imagining. Like that's why I think imagination is such a beautiful thing. Because if you can't imagine something, it's really hard to, to kind of step into something new. So just in, in talking about communitas too, I mean, if there's one thing all of us could be doing is use our creative intention and imagination to keep imagining where we're heading as a humanity in its best version. I actually think that is, it's like parting some clouds so we can actually start going there and see where we're heading. Um, but on, on the note of your question is, even if you just begin with the smallest little step of can I, can I just open the doors or the windows of my imagination and just imagine that there is some, some me, some, some self in me that is actually whole? Can I just even just start just with that? That might be a beginning. Awesome. Thank you so much. Elf, you had a question. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, my question was trying to get around how do you support communitas in kind of a governance role? Like a lot of times uh, when you deal with governance, sometimes you just want certain things to emerge and not trying to overly design logically ahead of times. But obviously, without good governance, a lot of communities implode. Um, and then I just was in Israel traveling a bunch of kibbutzes. Uh, and that was one of the patterns I noticed was this uh, rigidity of ideology and they had to become flexible over time. So they were stuck to a co communist ideology for better or worse. And the environment forced a, sh a shift. And they looked at that as a failure. And I looked at that as kind of, oh, you had to experiment and pivot. Um, but from their ideological view, it was a failure. But anyway, I'm just curious, the governance role. Um, and you kind of started to touch on it with a culture and ethics. I think it's related there, but. Um, I actually like, I, I, I've loved just listening to you because I feel like you've, you've held bits of the answer in what you were saying. Um, and maybe me just reflecting back will, will make you notice that like, one of the answers I would give that I, that I heard in what you're saying is that we think of governance in a, a, as a dynamic evolutionary thing, rather than that it's ever fixed. Because true governance is is in a way is governing in relationship to actual reality, like reality, like with a big R. And I think a lot of what happens with governance is you come up with roles and functions and it, like you say, it gets stultified, it gets very rigid. And as soon as it's gotten rigid, it's out of touch with what gave rise to why this particular person held this role or this function. So to include in, in any kind of governance going forward, evolution like tucked right into its very fabric the, the, that it does need to pivot and turn and stay ideally um yeah in touch with reality on a daily basis is a huge thing so a, a, it's dynamic by nature um the other piece that comes to mind is that governance that I think would work best has a lot to do with right relationship, like both right relationship with myself and with others. Like what, what is really mine to do? What's yours to do? You know, having lived in community for, for 10 years, we, we realized very quickly that consensus decision-making was not a governance tool that we wanted to employ because it was a headache. It, you know, it can be a step along the way, but you end up sitting potentially in a circle for many hours and feeling like, you know, the sun's going down soon and the garden really needs to get planted. <laughs> and so we found that it made a lot more sense to um, notice who, whose is it to hold the overview of, say, the garden, and then to empower that person and whoever was 
flocking around that person to then go do and yes check in report back get get feedback if needed but to 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 go with what's sometimes i think the answers are actually more simple than we think like we like to make things incredibly complicated uh and and i agree life is incredibly complex but can we kind of like feel the the full complexity and then and then look through it and go is there actually a simplicity on the other side there and so that's another piece that comes to mind around governance is what is natural what just makes sense some people just naturally have um overview they, they they just naturally have this overview they're not necessarily skilled in any little particular field but they always have this meta perspective on the whole um so someone like that would be much more suited to project management or leadership you know of the ship rather than a particular room on the ship um and then you know this is, I think, governance that we have not yet explored, but I think at the, the edge of what's possible would be a whole other kind of governance, which includes what I just said, but it is the coming together in our humble, authentic selves that are unique and beautiful and distinct from each other, but not in that rival or separate, separate way. Coming together like that, and in my experience, there actually is an other that can enter the space. And what if, what if that other that is made up of the sum total of us gathered and more, what if that could actually be the ultimate governing voice and we're in relationship to it, listening for what is each of ours to do. And because if, if we could literally get through that eye of the needle, like, you know, when you said communitas was, uh, was intimacy right in that liminal space, I have to think of you, you theory, like if you can get to the bottom of the you, like really get to like, you, you've emptied, 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 and you just don't know. And then you start to listen for what's emergent. Well, what if, what if governance could be listening for that, that which comes when we've come together, emptied to the bottom of the you, and now we're listening, we're listening from the future. Like, I don't think we've even begun to live what's possible as far as governance. I think we just have some clues around, I, I, my clues are like it needs to be evolution, it needs to, it needs to make sense as in be natural, but it needs to be able to change at a moment's notice, et cetera. Thank you. All right, beautiful. Um, so we are at the hour, um, it's probably wise to close out here. Um, Miriam, do you have any closing thoughts for us or anything that came alive for you uh, throughout today's session? Uh, probably just my enjoyment of hanging out with you all. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's been just lovely and seeing a few of the faces and and uh, and you holding the space like this, Peter, and the inquiry. Like I, I feel heartened, really, I feel heartened to know that you all exist and that you care about this topic and that um, because it, it can feel so daunting. So maybe I just want to gather my heartedness with hopefully some of yours and put it in the middle and just remind us all, this is not a time to give up. This is a time to keep at this. Like those of us who feel that this is important, that, you know, are broken and cracked open by what's going on around the world. But, um, like just, I guess I just want to say, let's all take heart. Let's not give up. Uh, we, we've got to do this. We really do. Like I, we start thinking about the future and future generations and the children just being born. It's like, we, we can do this. And, it, and if we can remember that maybe it's easier than we think, like not like hard, but easy, or let's say it, maybe it's more simple than we think, even if it's hard, but I think we, we have everything we need at our fingertips. We really do. Mm. We, know, we know what it is like to be a decent human being. And, and we all have had moments that we remember, you know, even if it's just a tiny glimpse, we remember who we are. Yeah, I love that. And I especially found this session awesome. 
because what you're coming in with, just not only with your es uh, essence, your presence, um, but with what you're saying resonates really well with what we've been doing here uh, at the STOA for the last six months. Um, and there is sort of like, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of myself, this, this within the store and then kind of the buzz it's getting, there's like a boyish optimism that we're going to like steal the culture, you know, seduce the culture, heal the culture and the trauma scene that we're in. Um, and it's fun, you know, and it's exciting, uh, and delicious. Um, so thank you, uh, so much for coming to, uh, the store today. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, so I'll, I'll close out with some announcements. We have a, a few events, uh, today, uh, the Spiritual Mission of America and the Anthropocene uh, with Matthew Siegel. Uh, that's uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can RSVP there. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern time, we have Painting with Words, Loving Transformation or Something with Tim Adeline from The Voicecraft. And he's doing an interesting conversational practice. I have no idea. It's going to be like an art performance, I imagine. Uh, and then the election between Biden and Trump. <laughs> it's right after that. So, uh, you know, you can buckle up uh, with some psychotech before you watch that. And then uh, um, the website, Patreon, Substack. Uh, yeah. That being said, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Miriam. We'll close out with some music.